For Kruma Media's policy, I'm Tabi Madiba, former banking executive and CEO of Lesaka Technologies, Lincoln Mali, discusses his book titled Blazing a Trail, Lessons for African Leadership. In your book, you provide details of your family heritage, which is deeply woven in the history of Eastern Cape. So could you tell us about your great-grandparents who married across the color line and why, due to the pressure of apartheid, some of your family decided to move to a newly independent Zambia in 1964? Yeah, my, my, my family side, uh, my mother's side, uh, is, is the story of love. Uh, love of two uh, brothers who were uh, sons of an 1820 settler who settled in Hawkesbeck, uh, Thomas Summerton, and he had two sons, A.R. and J.G. Uh, and these two guys in the early 1900s fell in love with two beautiful uh, Chosa women who were sisters, uh, you know, Sareti and Violet. And obviously it was taboo for them to... Uh, even fall in love, let alone get married at all times. And so they endured a lot of uh, being ostracized, uh, a lot of being ill-treated, um, discriminated against, and, uh, and isolated. But through the years, um, you know, they brought up these families uh, of the Summertons, and they had a lot of love uh, for one another, they had a lot of love for their children and grandchildren. And so at an early age, I got exposed to this family because my mother is a grandchild of J.G. Uh, Summerton. So I could spend time on the farm in Hawksbeck and experience this at a very young age. Later on, uh, my great aunt was the first born child of all these two relationships and Ida Summerton asked me to investigate the family history because there were people in the UK who wanted to know what had happened to the Summertons that went to South Africa. So I started investigating this and on a hundredth birthday, I was able to give the, the family history and I was able to tell my kids about that. Now, one of the interesting things is that out of all of the pain they went through, and as the Group Areas Act and all the other acts were becoming uh, much more stringent, they were forced to take some of their children to Zambia, where they went to try and create a new life for themselves. So for me, the beauty of this story is not its pain. Actually, it's how it ends, um, in the sense that these two couples are still buried together in the old farm in Hogsberg, still together, still united. They were ahead of their time. And it really is a message that people who love one another, whoever they may be, no government or law, uh, you know, or religion or culture should impede how people, uh, you know, feel about one another. And so I thought that for my children to understand themselves as Africans, it's important for them to understand a part of their history, that part of their history comes from a settler community, part of their history come from the Kosa uh, nation, part of their history is also embedded in what happened in Zambia. And so that's been uh, the, the reason why I thought it would be an important part uh, to include uh, in the book. And in your teenage years, you played a significant leadership role in the anti-apartheid student movement. So what did this period of your life teach you about the art of leadership? I think in the beginning, I was an unconscious leader in the sense that I had been appointed or selected to be uh, you know, a captain of a cricket team and playing leading role in school. And then I got involved in student politics and still I wasn't as conscious a leader as I, I probably should have been. But it was part of um, you know, the the feeling we had as young people that we should make the country ungovernable and make the apartheid system unworkable. So we were a group of very angry young people and we were in and out of jail. We uh, were trying to skip the country. We had been expelled from school. What really made me a much more conscious leader was a deep conversation I had with my father. And we had not been studying for two years. And my father was asking, when are we gonna go back to school? And I was like, dude, we want guns, we want stones, we want to fight. And this guy was telling me, no, I want you one day to go to Harvard. I was like, where's that? You know, I want to fight. 
And my father had this conversation with me that if you really want to lead and you want to change society, firstly, you have to change yourself and you have to lead yourself. You have to embrace the best values. You have to make sure that you're exemplary in everything that you do. You have to uh, attain the best marks and then you have to model yourself towards the society that you want. That conversation was a life changer. And I think the biggest lesson I learned on that day was that leadership is not about excitement. It's not about uh, being in the forefront. It's really about introspecting and being able to lead yourself in order to lead others, to change yourself in order to change others, and to put a cause or a mission above your own personal interests. And that was a big lesson that has stayed with me all my life. And you were inspired by the leadership style and agenda of Nelson Mandela. So what are the chief lessons for African leadership that you draw from Mandela's example? It is said that today very few people actually talk about Madiba. But the reality of those of us who, who saw him at first hand and worked in his government and also saw him lead, he has a number of lessons that all of us should reflect on. And I think COVID brought these lessons to the fore, that the omnipresent leader, the all-knowing leader, is not going to succeed. What society is craving for are leaders with compassion. They are leaders with empathy. They are leaders with integrity. They are leaders who are selfless. And they are leaders who deeply care and put their constituency always at the center and are respectful for them. They're inspiring in their actions and they're inclusive in their decision-making. So those are some of the attributes I saw in Madiba. And I felt that as I got opportunities to lead, I should bark uh, you know, and not follow the path that I'd seen in the corporate sector of uh, command and control, being bossy, being bigger than everybody else. But I should follow this path, which is much more inclusive, much more caring and brings out the best in people. And that's really been a huge learning for me, uh, just learning at the feet of someone like Nelson Mandela. And all of us who were there at the time, we know the lessons we got from Mandela. It's not by coincidence that people would coin a phrase or a song that would say, Nelson Mandela, there's no one like him. And my argument is that there's many of us that can be like him if we let the egos to be put on the side and put the mission of leadership to be first. And after the arrival of democracy in South Africa in 1994, you served as a public servant working with the Minister of Education. But after some time, you moved into the private sector. And at some point, you played a leading role in Standard Bank. So reflecting on this process, you argue that you never left politics, rather politics left you. So what do you mean by this? I think that because my um, entire youth was spent fighting for the liberation of, of, of this country and had leadership principles uh, ingrained in me from a very young age, from liberation stalwarts like Govan Bakey and many other Robben Island uh, you know, uh, former prisoners, they were selfless, they were caring, they did everything for the betterment of society. I started to see things in the public sector that were not in line with my value system. They were not in line with the value system of the liberation movement. I started to see a disconnect between those who lead and the ones who are being led. I started to see people being in what I call a, a bubble of incumbency where they only spoke to one another and they were not listening to others. And people spending more time with one another in government circles or public sector circles, and they were not hearing what everybody was saying. But more profoundly, I started to see what later we would describe as corruption, nepotism, incompetence, and all of these things. There were things that I just could not relate to. And I started to see that a bigger number of people in the government we're in business, but we're in government. And you say, what are you in? Are you actually in government full-time 
or you are part-time in government, full-time in business. I also found that there were a growing number of people that were in business, but they were only in business in order to access government business. And so I found that this thing didn't really make sense to me. So what started uh, as probably a separation, uh, maybe, uh, maybe 1997, 1998, those years, became a full-blown divorce, you know, in the last 10, 12 years, as the worst of leadership values uh, were being displayed. The sense that the party, ruling party, was more important than the country, where people were making decisions uh, based on what's good enough for their families and their friends, and when you started to see corruption take hold. And so those of us who believed in those values had to speak out. And that was not being, uh, you know, uh, appreciated. But the politics I joined had left me. And so there was no reason for me to associate myself with those politics. And that's why politics divorced me. Tell us more about receiving the Distinguished Old Rhodian Award for being a true leader. And what is your take in whether Rhodes University should change its name? That was um, one of the most touching parts of my journey because uh, at Rhodes, I was a student leader. I was considered a rebel. At one point, I was uh, uh, tried in the university's court. I received a, uh, a suspended expulsion uh, together with two late dear friends and comrades, Mfuzo Mbebe and Keke Tule Papiani. So, so I'd left the campus not being regarded as a distinguished person <laughs> in any way, shape or form. I didn't even know that there was an award called the Distinguished uh, Old Rhodian uh, Award. And then one day I got a message that there were people who had seen the work I'd been doing on the continent and the work I'd been doing in communities and felt that that work is in line with the motto of Rhodes where leaders learn. And I was nominated uh, for this award and I accepted the award on behalf of many of my colleagues and comrades who were no longer with us, who I was with at university and felt that it was a coming home um, where finally we had been recognized for what we were and what we stood for. As for the decisions about roads, I have taken a keen interest over the years of being part of the university and what the university does and uh, interacting with university stakeholders, the vice chancellor and others, uh, also including uh, with seven other colleagues supporting bursaries uh, for students in the law department for the last 15 years that has produced six lawyers. So I've been part of the university's journey and I've always had a, f a strong view that says those of us who were there before must be respectful of those who are there now. So whatever views I might have about Rhodes University, the name, I will abide by whatever decision that's taken by the constituency that's there now whether it's the university community, the council, the senate, the students, whatever they prefer, I will uh, gladly go with that. The last thing I'd like to say is that I have also got a view strongly that says it's not only changing the name that matters, it's the content of an environment. I've seen many names being changed of hospitals, of roads and all of that. And sometimes the change of name is an embarrassment to the names that we've given to those people. When you have a hospital that's not functioning and you've given it an honor of naming it after an important stalwart or a name of a road that's full of potholes, you are actually doing a disservice to the name. So I, I'm not really hung up on names, but I'm hung up on content and change and transformation of an environment. If that is there and also additionally there's a name change, I'm all for it. But that's a decision that I think should be best left for to the university community. If I were to be given my uh, give my views, I'll give them as an ordinary convocant of the university. And you have led teams in the corporate environment and have seen both successes and failures. So what do you think is the recipe for leadership success in the corporate environment and what errors should be avoided? I think the biggest, which I hope I will convey strongly through the book 
is put the people first in real terms. And I'm not talking about a PR exercise. I'm talking about really caring for people that you work with and create an environment where they can succeed and achieve some things that they never thought they would achieve. That's probably one of the first messages that comes hopefully through the book. The second one is the importance of diversity, inclusion, and a sense of belonging. I think leaders who always want to lead people that look like them, sound like them, are not going to succeed. The more diverse your teams are, the better it is for leaders in terms of gender, in terms of race, in terms of different ways of thinking. I found that to be very beneficial in my journey. Thirdly, being receptive to feedback is an important part of leadership. Understanding what people are saying and they give feedback that they give you. The fourth one is bringing yourself to work and being authentic as a leader and being approachable as a leader is very, 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 very important uh, for me. And lastly, it's the notion of not seeing success only in financial terms of what the PNL or the balance sheet should be, but see it in more broader terms. Have you made a positive impact in the lives of those you lead? Have you made a positive impact in the community and in your customers? I think that for me has been the things that I've really treasured. And I hope that young leaders who in any way kind of follow the story or read the book will take those things through so that it's not only about your ego and what you've achieved, it's what you collectively as a team have done and achieved. That would call it be my kind of recipe for success, as it were. But it's a lonely road. That's why I talk about a different trail. Don't go where the road may lead. Go where there's no road or no path and create a different path. And that's what I hoped uh, I did in the 25 years or so I've been in the financial sector. And lastly, Lincoln, you end your book with a message of of hope for South Africa. So what do you think will take to turn the country around, make the economy grow more rapidly and more inclusively? I think it's for people to rise, for people not to wait for what is happening in the ruling party conference or any other political party conference, for people not to wait for political leaders to think they've got all the answers. When we were young, we had hope for liberation when it was all dark. This country has got amazing people, amazing entrepreneurs, amazing young people. And I think that if all of us in our spheres of influence don't look around and wait for somebody, make a difference in your sphere of influence. If we do that collectively, I think we can be able to make a difference. Of course, government is important. Of course, uh, politics are important. But I think what we've done as society, we've demobilized and allowed government and politics and politicians to be the ones that dictate everything. My sense is that civil society organizations, uh, student organizations, communities must be able to say these things are in our control. We will do these things in our control and drive them. Government, please meet us halfway or somewhere. But for now, many communities are waiting for government waiting for political parties and i don't think that's the right answer and so for me personally the 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 journey i've been over the last 15 years and community projects i've had i'm continuing with that and the proceeds from the book will go to advance those things because to for me to be successful as an individual but the societies i come from are less successful that would not be good that would be a betrayal of what I grew up with and what I stand for. So I think that South Africans, uh, young people in particular, women have to rise up and say, these things are unacceptable. And we're going to show that we are not uh, taking this. A small example is Etoles. Society said, we will not accept Etoles. Government said, hey, you will take this. There were spokespeople like Jimmy Mang and others said, you will pay for Etoles. <laughs> Etoles are now being scrapped. So there are many ways in which society can say, no, this cannot happen. Gift of the givers are able to go and do things. So there are many things that our societies can do on their own and not only wait for politicians. And so I have great hope in the people of this country and what they can do. And I'm going to play my part.
That was Lincoln Mali speaking to Krima Media's polity about blazing a trail, lessons for African leadership.